Hello and welcome to the CX Files podcast. I'm your host, Mark Hillary. Stephen Lloyd is the principal analyst at Trendsow, based in Arlington, Virginia, in the shadow of the Pentagon. He was on this podcast back in March as part of an analyst panel discussion, and he predicted then that companies will need to plan for a prolonged period of disruption because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, it looks like he was right, so I called him for an update on what he thinks the new normal will look like. Okay, Steve, thanks for being on the, the podcast. So when this, um, when this pandemic really started breaking out and, uh, and the lockdown was started in most countries around the world, we had a group chat here on CX Files, uh, and the, you know there was yourself and some other analysts, and you said at the time that companies need to be prepared for 18 to 24 months of disruption. And back then, in March, that sounded really pessimistic, but how do you think it stands up now? Yeah, I remember that, Mark. It, it, even I, at the time, kind of was thinking, gee, that does seem like a long time, and yet here in the United States, and I'm here in Washington, D.C. Uh, recently, uh, I think it was yesterday that, that Dr. Anthony Fauci said, we're still in the first wave of this thing. We haven't even hit the second wave. And, you know, this morning in the news, I saw that Oklahoma, um, where there's supposed to be a big uh, presidential rally this weekend, is among the states that's reporting record number of uh, new cases along with the states like Arizona and Florida, Nevada, Oregon, uh, Texas, they're all reporting their biggest one day increases uh, just this week. And then, you know, now you're hearing about things in Arizona and Texas that they're going to require masks and things like this. So um, I, I think the estimate is there's about 800 Americans that are dying every day. And if you, If you bring that out to September, that would mean that over 200,000 people by then will have died from this. And so I'm also seeing that China, they're having some issues um, with some new cases as well. And, um, you know, I recently read a piece in in the I think it was the May 11th issue of the New Yorker magazine. Um, And the name of the article for your listeners is called The Warnings. why we should have known to prepare for COVID-19. And the writer interviews a doctor who used to be with the CDC. um, And he talks about how there's so many diseases out there. The first few paragraphs are kind of mind numbing of this article. Um, and, And the doctor explains that there's new diseases emerging all the time. And the writer was reflecting upon a visit that he had with this doctor back in 2006. Um, when he first started to learn about what the CDC calls special pathogens. Um, And these are zoonotic is the term, meaning that they can pass from animals to to people very easily. And they're new to science and to human immune systems, as the doctor explains in the article. And they emerge unpredictably and are are really difficult to treat. And that's what we're seeing now. Um, And... uh, Nassim Taleb has talked about how these these pathogens, they're almost a part of the structure of the modern world now because of humanity encroaching on nature and the nature of globalization. Um, But I thought the winning quote in that article was that that there's a real lack of imagination. And I really like that because um, I wrote something similar in a blog on my website in March that, you know, back in the mid 2000s, when uh, analysts were writing about the need to be more aggressive, perhaps, with the the work-at-home model. Um, uh, You know, there was a lot of skepticism from some some providers, and uh, I was calling it home-shoring at IDC, but I I think there was a lack of imagination as far as the home-based agent model went and its applicability and its relevance. And I think maybe there's still a lack of imagination on what this current crisis means, how long it could go on and what some of the knock-on effects could be. And we're seeing those obviously uh, in the United States with with a lot of the protests and and things that are not unrelated to um, what's happening with COVID. So yeah, we, uh, 
we said this could be a, an extended issue, and it's it's certainly looking like that now um, for me anyway. Yeah, that's interesting. You're talking about the work from home there as well, because you know clearly we've seen uh, companies forced to adopt work from home really urgently. Um, and, and I mean, what are your clients and the companies that you're talking to saying about this situation with all the offices that they have? Because you know, are, are we going to look at future CX solutions being much more blended and naturally embracing work from home? Because you know, how can you manage social distancing uh, using the old floor plans uh, in contact centers where normally you'd be stuffing as many people as you can into a small area? Yeah, I, I agree. Imagine some of the conversations that are taking place in the leadership suites at some of the big PPOs. I mean, recently, you and I talked about this weeks ago, but uh, an Amazon employee in New York City, uh, Chris Smalls is his name, he was fired. Uh, after raising concerns about the dangers of, of COVID in Amazon warehouses. Um, and on May 1st, which is May Day, you had big strikes from workers from Amazon and Target and FedEx, Instacart, Whole Foods. They all went on strike to protest working conditions. And, you know, if you think about BPOs, we've seen instances in contact centers getting in trouble with governments overseas for violating different policies uh, put in place to try to prevent the spread of the disease. So I think once leases expire on some of the buildings, the changes inevitably are going to be made at some of the BPOs. Um, and if my answer to your first question is correct, um, then companies and their vendor partners might need to be ready for kind of a protracted siege um, or, or at the very least, uh, be much more agile and adaptable to what's what's happening. Um, so the work from home model is is now table stakes, as I think you're suggesting, and I and I certainly think that's the case. Yeah, and I was thinking about how does this impact some of the big guys? You, you know, the kind of uh, teleperformance and Sykes uh, that have got dozens of big contact centers all around the world, and surely their business model is based on how many seats they can get into each center. So, so do you think that they can manage to rework how the financial model works or are they just going to be unviable? Yeah, it's going to impact them, no question, in my mind, Mark. I mean, what they do have is great leadership, the, the companies that you mentioned. Danielle Julien might have the best mind in the business and Sykes has long been known as one of the best um, BPOs operationally, and they also happen to have, um, you know, a guy like Jim Farnsworth who knows the work from home model better than most. So um, these are among the best run BPOs in the world. They'll take on this challenge with, I, I, I think, with skill and even with enthusiasm. Um, and that's what I'm seeing from the leaders in the industry. It, it's the BPOs that lack that level of leadership. Um, that aren't run, run as well um, that one would worry about more. And so you'll probably also see some, some acquisitions come over time from all this. Um, and, you know, still, even with the good, the big, well, really well-run BPOs, expect to see some tough numbers in the second quarter. Um, so the, the quality providers will figure this out over the long term. Um, it's the lesser entities that one would worry about um, over time, I would think. Okay, yeah, yeah. And I mean, during this this period, the last three months, especially when, when people have been locked down, we've seen some industries, uh, things like gaming, streaming, um, e-commerce, you know, they, they've all been doing very well during this period. Do you think that people's habits are going to change and, and, and like consumer habits will change and they can continue to be successful or is this really just a, like a temporary bump, you know, because people are stuck at home? I, I think there'll be considerable stickiness. Um, you know, you did a, a, a good podcast with Alistair Netterer, of uh, the CEO of the Ember Group here in North America. And I think he said, if you can, comp the comparison would be with the work from home model. So we're up to something as high as 70 or 80% of 
people are now working from home and eventually you would expect that to go down to, I think he, he said something like 20%, but regardless, whatever the number is, the, the, the metaphor is apt in, the, in, in what you're saying as well. I think that, you know, if, if we started from a work from home base of around five or seven to 10% that we're working from home and it went up to 70 to 80% and it'll go back down, but not all the way and stay at 20 or 30%, the same thing will probably happen with uh, the habits and some of the, the uh, spaces that you're talking about, such as gaming, if that makes sense. Um, and I, I, I brought this up before, uh, Amazon, their HQ2 is, it's rising in real time right next door to me in Arlington, Virginia, where you've also visited, you've been here, we've had a few beers here, but it's amazing how fast HQ2 is coming along. And so um, they're kind of, they're, they seem to be thriving. I read a piece that Bezos is the only um, billionaire that's actually not only lost, not lost money, but he's made considerable amount of money through this crisis. Um, and Zoom is another one that's done well. I just saw in another announcement that uh, Genesis is, of course, teaming up with, with Amazon Web Services for the cloud solution in their in their contact center. So there's going to be real stickiness in the model. Um, there was also a Ernst and Young a couple of months ago uh, talking about uh, uh, a survey that they did there uh, talking about how all companies across industries, particularly starting with retail, are trying to accelerate their automation as uh, as they try to adapt to things. So I think it was something like 41% of respondents said that they were investing in an acceleration of automation, um, which also goes to your question. Um, they were planning for kind of major transformation before this hit, but that is just speeding up the nature of that. And so the stickiness, I think, will be considerable with the industries and the companies um, that are thriving now um, after this thing clears, whenever that is. Yeah, and that, that, that point about automation is interesting because I wanted to ask if you feel that this, this process of lockdown and social distancing and the kind of behavioral change that we've seen is going to change the way that companies need to address their, their CX strategy. I mean, are we going to see different types of communication or behavior from consumers that, that change the, the, the nature of how brands interact with people? Yeah, definitely. And um, I think Alistair also mentioned this too. I mean, you know, digitization is accelerating. And so new business models that we were talking about, things like uh, automation and omni-channel, hyper personalization. Um, we're not going back, you know, and it's not just for customers, hyper personalization. What's becoming more and more interesting to me is it's about employees as well. Um, how many of us want to put up with working for companies that have sclerotic systems that, that not only are bureaucratic, but working with, with tools and trying to get things done, um, becomes, um, you know, an overly labored process and difficult process. So, um, you know, all those things are accelerating those new business models being pushed by, you know, disruptive technologies we all know about, like mobile AI analytics, um, the IoT and the cloud that I just mentioned with AWS and Genesis being an example. So, um, you know, automation is is going to accelerate because of the current um, crisis. And, and that's pretty obvious. Um, and uh, yeah, there's just no, no real going back, it seems to me. Well, yeah, that, I mean, that, that's a sort of good point to, to end on. But then if, we, if we're looking at the future and there's real disagreement, you know, some people are extremely optimistic and they think there's gonna be a quick bounce back uh, some are very negative and pessimistic, and, and they're assuming there's going to be another wave of the pandemic, and and that you know we might not have a vaccine for years. So we've kind of got to learn how to live with this. Um, I mean, given all of this uncertainty, what what would be your advice to managers that are planning how to implement or change their CX processes at, at the moment? I mean, what what are the the, the key 
things they should be thinking of? Yeah, I love this question, Mark. Um, I'm an optimist, so a few years uh, to stay on the Amazon example, Jeff Bezos said we're living in a golden age, and we were in the early phases of that. Um, and I've mentioned a book by Peter Diamandis, the head of the X Prize Foundation, called Abundance, The Future is Better Than You Think, and he updated it just a year or two ago. Um, and I'm on board with that still, despite the current crisis. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't face our current reality um, and prepare for a siege, as we talked about at the beginning of this, this chat, um, as well as the possible ripple effects of what's happen, happening now. So think of the, the protests and the rioting that's going on in the United States. Again, not unrelated to COVID. Um, there's a, I'm sure you've read Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. Uh, it's a must read for anyone listening who hasn't read about it. But there's a part of the book where he talks about um, what they term the Stockdale paradox. And it's uh, based on um, Admiral Stockdale, Jim Stockdale, who was uh, a prisoner of war in Vietnam. And uh, he was uh, captive there for, I think it was eight years. Um, and he was tortured many times, as were some of the, the other guys that were there with him. Um, and when he was interviewed in Good to Great, they describe how um, he, he retained this vigorous optimism. He never doubted that he would get out. Uh, and that he would prevail in the end, and that he was going to turn this into the defining event of his life, and he was going to be positive about it. But then in Good to Great, uh, Collins talks about there's also a paradox there, because while um, Stockdale had this faith and this optimism, um, he, he also knew that, um, you know, he, he didn't want to get lost in a dreamy optimism that he saw some of his friends around him succumb to. They would, um, they were very optimistic and say, oh, we'll be out by Christmas or we'll be out by Thanksgiving. And those day times would come and they weren't out and they would give up hope and they would lose heart. Um, because as Stockdale described it, they, the optimists were the dreamy optimists. They failed to confront the reality of the situation at the same time as they were optimistic. And they sort of stuck their head in the sand. And it was kind of a self-delusion that helped them in the short term. But in the long term, they succumbed to, to you know, to madness or they gave up hope and they were broken. Um, and he wasn't because he was an optimist, but he also accepted the reality of what was going on. And he looked it in the eye and confronted it uh, with all the courage that he could. And so I think that the 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 really good leaders of BPOs are going to be doing that with their companies um, as we go through this. And so that, that's kind of how I like to look at this as well. Um, you know, if you read that New Yorker piece that I mentioned at the beginning of the chat, um, there are some sobering thoughts in there and around the science of pathogens and how, you know, new ones can emerge at any time. And we got very lucky with SARS, which had, something like a 10% death rate. Um, but for some reason, uh, there probably the reaction was pretty good to it and it happened to die out. But if it hadn't and was spreading like we have now, you might have an even more perplexing and difficult and scary situation. So um, we have to be sober and realistic and we have to have uh, agile, resilient business planning Work from home is definitely a part of that, and it's going to stay around. Thanks for listening to the CX Files podcast. Please take a moment to review the podcast because this helps other listeners to find it. And if you have any suggestions, then get in touch with me on Twitter or LinkedIn. I'm at Mark Hillary with two L's. Or just search Google for Mark Hillary.